Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue putting uh, the temple on a line. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here this morning as we open your word together. We ask for light for our feet, that you can give us strength for today to walk in the light that you have given us, that we can understand these things, that we can share them, and that we can reveal your character to others. Uh, we pray for um, those around us that we have an influence with. And we ask, Lord, that um, the truths that we uncover, uh, that they can be of practical use. We pray for this movement. We ask, Lord, that you can give us the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning once again. Now, this is uh, the last study this week. because It's Thursday. Um, August 17th. <clears throat> It was on this date um, in uh, 586 on the Julian calendar that uh, the temple was destroyed. So August 11th, 585 um, Gregorian and August 17th, 586 Julian. Um, and that's according to uh, the Babylonian calendar, the 10th day, of the fifth month. If you look at our calendar converter, it will have the ninth day of the fifth month, but we take the position that the temple was destroyed according to the Babylonian calendar. At least that's the position I take. <clears throat> anyway, that's just a side note. Now here we've been looking at this line of the temple. And in this line of the temple, we had um, this dedication of the temple that we see here in Ezra chapter six. Um, Verse 13 to 18 is this story of the temple dedication. It's finished and it's going to be dedicated. And um, we have this verse 14 where it says, The elders of the Jews built it and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes king of Persia. And so we have these three commandments um, that are involved in the building of the temple. And we know that, that the word commandment here is not the one that we usually see. Well, we, we sometimes see this word, but sometimes we see the word commandment to be uh, debar, the word. Or in this case, it's, it's a different word um, that if my program here, which, which has to do with a, a judgment, and it comes from the word taste, right? So the idea of, uh, if you think about of a judgment as being a taste or a judicial sentence, um, I, I think the idea here, the, the idiom, the expression, uh, comes from the, the idea of discernment, discerning something. So... So it's a little bit different. It's it's not really, I mean, obviously it's a command, but it's a, a different type of commandment. So this is this decree. So this is this discernment of these kings and giving this commandment, this judgment about things. And you can see that, especially with um, uh, Darius, I mean, he's had to uh, evaluate Cyrus's decree and Cyrus he had to evaluate and make a decision on what he was going to do do so in some ways this is like a, a decision or a discretion they have here so these are decisions that were made by Cyrus Darius and also Artaxerxes now we know Artaxerxes decree hasn't come yet at this point when the temple is finished and the, and the temple is finished on the third day of the month Adar which is in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So we have this uh, sixth uh, sixth year 
third day, 12th month. <clears throat> and, uh, and then what's going to happen is we're going to have uh, all of these offerings that are given and then the Passover being celebrated. Now, we had looked at uh, this in the context of Samuel Snow's letters. So we're going to look at that a bit more in detail again. And I'm just trying to go there. Right. So I know this, again, this is this messy diagram. But the idea here is that Samuel Snow writes his first letter, February 16th, and that's going to be two months and 16 days before his second letter. It's going to be published six days later on February 22, 1844, and that date is the third day of the 12th month on the biblical calendar. Um, obviously, in 1844, it's the 22nd day of the second month, but on in 515 BC, when the temple is dedicated, it's the third day of the 12th month. And so that symbol there, the three and the 12, uh, become important third day of the 12th month because they're inversions of each other. And then the Passover is going to follow on um, the 14th day of the first month. Now in 515 BC, that's going to be the same space of time from when the letter is first published to when it's republished. So it's going to be published in the Midnight Cry, and then it's going to be republished in the Signs of the Times with a caveat. That, that is, we're going to say, we're publishing this at the request of Samuel Snow, this letter that was published in the Midnight Cry, uh, but we don't agree with it, which I think is something quite, quite important in Millerite history is the idea that um, in their main paper, they're going to publish something because it's of interest, even though they don't agree with it. And, and they say quite plainly, we don't see that the periods extend beyond the spring of 1844. Um, of course, later, they're going to come to accept this idea. But they're willing to publish something that they don't agree with, with just simply a caveat. You can study this. You can make your own decision about it. This is our opinion. And, and I think that's an important uh, detail, understanding uh, how the Millerites were coming to, to look at things, to understand truth. So we're not going to look at all of Samuel Snow's letters here, but we, we note that these dates um, are going to be connected symbolically with Samuel Snow's letters. And uh, so, so we just, we, we have to see this as important. So what happens here in this second decree? Because we know, of course, the third decree is definitely connected uh, to Samuel Snow's letters because the events in uh, 457 BC are going to be lining up with events in 1844, as well as Samuel Snow's letters. So these things are all going to fit together. So the fact that the second decree also fits in with Samuel Snow's letters, I think is important. And, and there's probably things that we're gonna notice as we continue to go through uh, this, this history uh, leading up to Daniel chapter 10, 11 and 12, um, that, that these, are, these are gonna be important in how we, we create these lines. <clears throat> So anyway, we have this line of the temple, and I adjusted a few things on it. So at Stephen's suggestion, I moved uh, Cyrus's decree to the arrival of the first message. So what we have here is we have uh, the 70 years captivity um, that's, that's just placed in there to show you this structure, how we have the 21 years and the 49 years to make up the 70 years. But the darkness here is the darkness of there not being a temple. Now, the temple itself is not going to be restored at the time at the end of this line, because if we have the first angel arrive, Cyrus's decree, we can see, though, that this decree 
is going to address the laying of the foundation of the temple. So Cyrus is decree. Cyrus is the Lord's anointed. He's been surnamed, you know, uh, more than a hundred years previous to his, his birth in the book of Isaiah. And Cyrus then is going to issue this decree. And we believe that that's Daniel chapter 10. So Daniel chapter 10, the 24th day of the first month after this 21 days of fasting. And remember, we connected this 21 days of, of fasting and prayer with the 21 years that preceded the fall of Jerusalem where the temple is destroyed. Now, Daniel himself is, is praying and fasting because he wants this decree that had been prophesied in uh, the book of Jeremiah, and uh, he wants this decree to be fulfilled, right? So, so this promise and, and Isaiah, so he, he wants this to this captivity to end. And then we put the building of the altar as this formalization. So the people have returned and then they build this altar. And so we would move the formalization to the building of the altar. And then we would have the empowerment as being the foundation of the temple being laid. And in this history, of course, we're going to have the work of the enemies. Now, there's some discussion regarding how Jeff had looked at this history and uh, where we got this symbol of the work of the enemies. And, and Stephen had suggested, well, the idea of the foundation, that's about 2010, um, and that they were studying this line of the decrees and, and so the language that we have, the laying of the foundation, <coughs> the work of the enemies, they come from the study of this, except we know that the foundation itself being laid had been talked about before. That is, the charts are the foundation, and Ellen White talks about the foundation of this message. So we still haven't looked into it, but you know, we, I'm going to try to do some searches in uh, Jeff's papers and see where we start talking about the foundation of the temple and the work of the enemies. Definitely the work of the enemies here parallels the work of the enemies in Millerite history. And we usually look at the foundation of the temple as the charts themselves, right? So that's the foundation is the charts, the 1843 chart. And then we know what happens when that chart is made. We're going to have the opposition uh, begin in Protestantism uh, against uh, Miller. So before that, the Protestant churches had welcomed Miller because he's increasing their coffers. But at that point in 1842, when they make the chart, the 1843 chart, that's in May, in June of 1843, or 1842, pardon me, then the Protestants are going to begin to close their doors. And so we could see that that's the work of the enemies. And then we have the second angel arriving. So here we place the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. Now it's a doubling, right? So we know that that relates to the second angel's message. So there's two of them. They're both going to begin prophesying in 520 BC. And because of their prophesying, the temple is going to construction is going to resume after it had been stopped. And, and in that history where it stopped, it's going to be false Mertis in there. He's going to be the king of Persia for seven months, and he's going to put an end to uh, the construction of this temple. Now, Haggai and Zechariah begin their prophesying. The people begin to build the temple. And then we looked at uh, Darius. He's going to get this letter um, from Tatnai and these others. And um, and then he's going to do a search. So he's going to search for this document of Cyrus. He finds it, and then he's going to issue his own decree, which we place in 516 BC. And then, if this is in the summer, we're going to find uh, some months later. So seven, eight months later. We're not sure exactly when the decree occurs but we're going to have this dedication of the temple in March. 
So it might be eight, maybe nine months later that the temple is completed. It's going to be dedicated. And then 40 days later, you're going to have the Passover. And so what I did is I moved the Passover. I put this in here. We didn't have it in the line yesterday when we finished, but I placed it as the arrival of the third message. So if we can discuss this a little bit, um, does this line make sense? Especially once I've placed the Passover as the third angel arriving. Um, can this be acceptable? Is there any light we get from this as we put this line together? Is there, are there things that we notice that we hadn't noticed before? Okay, over on your Passover, yeah, it should be 14th day instead of 41st day. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. I just typed backwards. Um, there we go. Whoops, no, that didn't even work. No, oh, that's why. There we go. Using the wrong keyboard. Okay. <laughs> So the 14th day of the first month, yeah. And and that's gonna be, um, you know, about 40 days. I can't remember uh, exactly in this case, but I mean, if you had 30 days to the third, uh, then you would have 11 days to the 14th. But I think that month had 29 days, I'm not certain. Um, but anyway, it's about 40 or 41 days, depends on the length of the 12th month. <clears throat> I find the arrival of the second angel to be interesting being in 520. Okay, and that is because well what we were what what I had been led to look at that I sent you the other day regarding you know, 163 and okay. these, years, these other sabbatical years, potential sabbatical years, mm -hmm. 520 fits right in that. Yeah. Yeah. And so whether it's the arrival of the second angel or whatever, it is, of course, when Haggai and Zechariah begin their prophesy. Right. I mean, Haggai only prophesies in that year. Zechariah uh, begins in that year and he's going to prophesy again a couple of years later so okay so what about the line itself is does this does this give us any other light i probably could move this here because that's the dedication now we know, of course, Solomon's temple stood for 420 years, right? From its dedication to its destruction was 420 years. And so then you have the 70 years is a sabbatical of rest, right? So you have six times 70 is 420. So his temple operates for 420 years. Then it's destroyed. And then the temple rests for 70 years. So that would be the Sabbath of the temple. And, and I find it interesting, um, you know, because when, when I worked on this chronology, I mean, obviously I didn't uh, contrive that. I didn't say I need the temple to be built in this year and I need it to be 420 years for the temple to exist and then 70 years. This is just something that was noticed after the fact. So once I had the chronology in place, then I was able to discover all of these structures. And somebody looking on could just say, oh, you know, you chose this year for the for the the building of Solomon's temple, you know, because you wanted there to be 420 years plus 70 years uh, between the two dedications. And, and of course, that wasn't the case. Um, so none of this is 
was created to create these things, you know. Uh, and, and same with the 490 years uh, from the anointing of Saul to the captivity of Daniel, with uh, the 70 years of probation from Manasseh being taken captive in 677. So we have 1097, Saul's anointed. Once they have a king, they are not observing the sabbatical rest of the land and the Jubilees. Um, there were occasional attempts at times to uh, to do that, but for the most part, it's just the people were not observing this uh, sabbatical rest, and that goes on for 490 years, and then Daniel's taken captive. So that 70 years is also attached to a 490-year period. So, so these two things um, are just, you know, I could say they're an artifact of the chronology. They're just a fact that is created because of the chronology. The chronology is not created to, to create these things, right? So, so we're going to have this period of time from uh, the destruction of the temple to Cyrus's decree. You can definitely see that that's 70 years. And, you know, so I could move the 70 years here, right? I mean, in a technical sense, I mean, it's not exactly 70 years to the day, uh, but Cyrus's decree is going to happen in the summer of 516. Now, we don't know the day. I mean, it would be really nice if we could find some artifact, some archaeology, they dig up it and find Darius's decree, and, you know, and they have it dated, and it happens to be like the 10th day of the fifth month or something like that. Um, but we don't have that. All we have is uh, the fact of when his decree occurred, which is 70 years after the destruction of the temple. And so, so if this is, let's say, um, uh, you know, the 10th day of the fifth month, so if you go to the fifth month, it's going to be seven months until uh, the 12th month when the ded dedication of the temple occurs. So you could say it's 70 years and uh, well, it definitely is 70 years and seven months, but exactly when that decree occurs, we don't know, but it's about that time. It's, you know, it's probably in the fifth or sixth month that Cyrus gives his decree. <clears throat> okay, so does this line of the temple help us in any way in understanding uh, Daniel chapter 10? Because, and, and of course, chapter 11 and 12. Because that's what we're studying. And so we've drawn this out. We can find Cyrus's decree. It, it fits into this chronology. Um, we've created a line. This line appears to be solid. There are different ways we could create it. We know we have the line of the three decrees, which we're going to draw out as well, but uh, once we, we get there. Now, the other thing to remember about Daniel chapter 10, and even Daniel chapter 9. So when when Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, because I've been presenting that to the Romani people, um, that um, Daniel in the in in basically six months after uh, Babylon has fallen. He's seeking to to find the the understanding of the seventy years, and he knows that there's seventy years in the book of Jeremiah, and he's going to study Leviticus twenty six. He's not talking about the temple so much in Daniel chapter nine. He's just looking for the promise that if you return, if you repent and confess your sins then I will cause you to return. So he's at that point con con concerned about the return. In Daniel chapter 10, um, he's still concerned about the return. Um, it doesn't tell us specifically what he's praying about. Right. So if we um, go there. So. <clears throat> Of course, this is Ezra 6, where it talks about the Passover. So if we go to Daniel chapter 10, 
we know that Daniel was mourning three full weeks. And what it it says here in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. We said the conflict was great. And he understood the thing and he had understanding of the vision. So the thing, the matter, what is the matter that he understood? How did we, we come to uh, interpret that? This, this word, this debar. Because we know the understanding of the vision is the, going to be the 2300 days, the evenings and mornings. So what's the thing from Daniel chapter 8? Because that's where we, we get this from, partly, in Daniel chapter 9. So what's, what's the thing that he understood? Do we remember this? The vision of the evening and morning. Okay, so the vision of the evening and morning is not the thing, because that's going to be the vision, the mar mare. Now, we had in Daniel 9, 23, it's, um, there is the, we have, it says at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. Now that word commandment is debar. And then it says, understand the matter and consider the vision, right? So if we have these two put together here in Daniel 9, 23, we have the matter and the vision. And it says, understand the matter and consider the vision. So in Daniel chapter 10, when it says he understood the matter, it says thing, but it's the same word, and had understanding of the vision, just by comparing these two verses, can we say that, that those two are the same thing? That That's a parallel uh, verses. So it says, understand the matter and consider the vision. So what is the matter in this context? It's not the same thing as the 2300 days. No, you're showing that because, I mean, considering the vision would be the mare. So is the matter the 490 years? Yeah, that, that that's the question. Is that what it is? And, and I think that that's what it is. So it says, therefore, understand the matter. So, and, and then you're going to understand the matter in the context of the 2300 days. Now, we know that Seventh-day Adventists are always trying to, you know, connect the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, right? Right. And and so when we do that, we usually try to talk about how uh, the 70 weeks are determined or cut off, right? That word, kat, katak, however you pronounce that, katak, right? So that's, that word means to be cut off. Now, it means to decree, so 70 works are cut off, Right. And that's generally what you would see in a book or an evangelistic series. But because they don't really study these things the way that we do. Um, and if they had just had compared these two, they could see that that the Mara is this vision, the 2300 days. It's true. Right. And then we have this other thing called the matter. And you can see how the word matter is can be translated as thing 
but it could also be translated as commandment, right? Or word, right? So often it's mostly translated as word. And in Daniel uh, 9, 12, for instance, it's gonna talk about, um, um, you know, he, he confirmed his words, right? So, so we, it's a very common word, the word matter or word, but here it's placed in the context of the matter and the vision and understanding these two. And so we can understand that the word can be a decree because it's translated as decree as well, right? Now, it's only one place it's translated as decree, but that's in Second Chronicles 35. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba, even unto Dan, Second Chronicles 30 verse five. So you can see that that is a decree or a commandment here in Daniel 9, uh, 23, it's translated as two different ways. The commandment, it's translated in the first part at the beginning of thy supplications. The commandment came forth. And also it says, therefore, understand the matter. That's the same word as commandment. Consider the vision. So I think this is a, a much better argument. Maybe it's, it's um, it would take time to build the foundation for that, to show it to people. But it's definitely a much better argument for showing that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are connected. I mean, the whole thing of looking at Daniel chapter eight and chapter nine and chapter 10, putting them all together, that these, that these visions all are tied together. Uh, part of the problem is when we rejected the 2520, we, we um, made it more difficult to see these connections. So I'm going to take the position that the matter is the 70 weeks. And that in chapter 10, then, so it says, he understood the matter, the thing, and had understanding of the vision. It has to be that, that he understood the 70 weeks now, and, um, and he understood the 2300 days. He understood their connection. So this is why Daniel is mourning three full weeks because he has understanding of this. So remember in Daniel chapter nine, uh, he's gonna have this vision of the 70 weeks and it says that the city and the sanctuary are gonna be destroyed. Now, at that time, was there a city and a sanctuary? No. No. So. So this is not really very good news for Daniel because he's looking for them to be returned to the land, for the city to be built, for the sanctuary to be built. And now he's told that they're gonna be destroyed. So, and he understands that this is something in the future. So I think that's partly why he's mourning. But we also know that he wants to see the city and the sanctuary built in the first place. So, and this word mourning means to lament. So he's lamenting over what he sees. Now, um, so this whole history that's going to unfold, this prophecy about what's going to unfold in history in Daniel chapter 11, um, is meant to give Daniel hope because what he received in Daniel chapter nine, he doesn't have enough context to see the hope of it or in Daniel chapter eight. First Daniel chapter eight is just confusing, but when he is given Daniel chapter nine, the prophecy there, the 70 weeks, he now understands it, but it's still not something that's encouraging to him. So, so he's going to, to mourn for, for 21 days, which is gonna parallel the 21 years from when he was taken captive to the temple being destroyed. And then on the 24th day of the first month, he's gonna receive this vision. 
So in the context of our line that we've drawn, I mean, we know that Daniel is right here at the beginning. He's the, at the arrival of the first message in this line of the temple. Now, Daniel chapter 10, when we, when, when we look at Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, I mean, we know that it's ultimately going to uh, bring us to Millerite history and the end of the 2300 days and the 2520, right? And the 1335. It's going to bring us to Millerite history. And you can see how uh, the church, with its, basically its rejection of, of many of these prophetic periods, I mean, the church is almost wholly abandoned um, the prophetic periods, that there definitely is no way that they can understand the Daniel chapter 11, its purposes. So one of the things in studying Daniel chapter 11 that, that I think has been lacking, in the, in the most part, we just look at it as, a, as this line of history, but we've, we, don't, we don't draw it out on a line. Right? We, we take parts of it and we've used it and mixed it into our lines, but we haven't really took Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 and, and developed lines with these, not, not completely, right? That is, we've looked at probably way marks within that line and, and zoomed in on them and, and recognized lines. But overall, we don't have an understanding of, of that as a line. So it's one of the things that we're going to have to do in order to, to understand this history. Um, yeah, and there's a, a note in the chat by Angela regarding the, uh, the finished on the 25th day, and it's going to be 52 days in, in building the wall. So it's going to be, um, that's in Nehemiah 6.15. And uh, one of the things about that, so when we look at Ezra, right? So remember, we, we had noticed this before when we looked at Ezra 6.15. That's going to say, this house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which was the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And when we look at Nehemiah 6.15, um, it says, so the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elu, which is the sixth month, in 52 days. So, so we know that this includes the three days scouting the city. That's what we, we understand. And so that's going to be uh, 49 plus 3 to get the 52 days. So 7 times 7 plus 3. And... Um, so this 25 and 52, we can get, of course, uh, the 25 and uh, the 252 and the 525. Then, so another 2552. So 925 is Daniel 925 and 520. Is that what you're trying to say there? What What are you saying with the Daniel nine twenty five? Are you taking the twenty five there? I'm not sure. Yes, I I am. I just saw all these twos and fives. Okay, so you're just looking at all these twos and fives, and in um, so in Daniel nine twenty five, that's going to be um uh the three score in two weeks right so you're going to get these 62 weeks um and the seven weeks right so you got the seven weeks seven times seven um so you have that 49 there as well so i mean i don't think any of these things are coincidences how we have the wall finished and uh, the temple finished, both in these chapters 615. 
Now, now 615 as a symbol we don't really have that I know of. Oh, well, 516 BC. Uh, 615 BC? Oh, 615, and then you just scramble it, and you get 516 BC. Oh, 516 BC. Yes, so we have the decree in 516 BC. Okay, so that was, I knew there was something that we did there. Now, 516 itself, we don't have a sim as a symbol. It is interesting if you take 15 divided by 6, you get 2.5, which gives us another 25, right? So, so that ties that 25 together. So, okay, so, so we have this line, are people satisfied with this line? And we can now move to Ezra chapter 7. Stephen, are you happy with the line? Does this look better to you? You changed a few things. Yeah. So I put the Passover in there as the third angel arriving. I took your suggestion regarding the first angel and the formalization and the empowerment. So Haggai and Zechariah mark the second angel arriving. Darius's decree is formalization. The temple dedication is the empowerment. And then the Passover is a new message that arrives. I have to think about it. Okay. Okay, so so when we move then, so that's chapter six that gives us that Passover. And then it says in Ezra seven, now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and for some reason my screen didn't share. Let's do that properly. Um, then it's gonna list all these different people that are going to, um, go up from Babylon, right? So this is going to be under Ezra. This Ezra went up from Babylon, verse 6. He was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Now, um, so we know that there is an apocryphal book that adds some more details here. So in this story, does it say anything about what Ezra's request was? Does it give us any background? When we just jump into chapter seven out of nowhere, right? We shouldn't. Yeah, we, we, yeah. so it just seems kind of odd when you read uh, the King James here, all of a sudden you have Ezra chapter seven and, and how many years after 516 or 515 is this? So how many years is it between the end of chapter six and the beginning of chapter seven? Well, if chapter six would be about 516 BC, yeah, 515, yeah. 515. And then you got 457 is, so it's going to be 58 years. Right. So so you just have this jump with, with no real context. Why are we doing this, right? Why is this, this happening? Now, um, we have the... Uh, the Apocrypha, right? So we got, um, I'm just trying to find this here because it does add some details here. Now, some people, of course, don't, you know, say, well, it's not in the Bible. You know, it's not 
and, and we know that there are things in the Apocrypha that, that are not correct. But, um, but we do know that there are things here that are details that either were just left out, but we don't know why, or, or maybe details that had been added. Um, so I'm just trying to find this here. Oh, this is hard. I should have had this set up, but I wasn't quite ready to do this. So, um, are you looking then for Esdras chapter eight? Yeah, yeah, it's chapter eight, I think. But it's interesting because so much of the first part of chapter eight is repeating what we were seeing in Ezra, what you were just had on the screen with Ezra 7. Yeah, okay, so um, yeah, so for some reason I can't find this on my <coughs> Bible program, so I went online. Um, okay, here's what it says, uh, King James Version, Somebody's asking me, what's the King James Version A? This here, it's just the King James. KGVA. Uh, that's um, just another version of the King James. With it's, the Apocrypha. Yeah, with the Apocrypha, right. Ah, there we are. Okay. Uh, so after these things, when Artaxerxes, the king of the Persians, reigned, came Ezra, the son of Sarai. So it's going to give us more of this um, background information. It's going to give us his, his uh, pedigree. And then this Ezra went up from Babylon as a scribe, being very ready in the law of Moses that was given by the God of Israel. So it gives us this information, which is not in... Um, Ezra chapter 7, right? It gives us a lineage of Ezra. Right, yeah. And then Ezra went up from Babylon as a scribe, so that's similar to what it says in the King James. And the king did him honor, for he found grace in his sight in all his requests. And there went up with him also certain of the children of Israel, of the priests, of the Levites, of the holy singers, porters, the ministers of the temple unto Jerusalem. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, in the fifth month, this was the king's seventh year, for they went from Babylon in the first day of the first month and came to Jerusalem according to the prosperous journey which the Lord gave them. For Esdras had very great skill so that he omitted nothing of the law and commandments of the Lord, but taught all Israel the ordinances and judgments. Now the copy of the commission which was written from Artaxerxes the king and came to Esdras, the priest and reader of the law of the Lord, is this that followeth, right? And so we're gonna have this decree. Um, it's obviously because this document is translated from Greek instead of from Hebrew. Some of the language is a little bit different, but basically it's the same, uh, the same message. And it's gonna talk here, you know, about the silver and the gold that, that's going to be given, the holy vessels, all of these same, same ideas. Uh, I, I haven't compared them, you know, point by point. Um, and then they're going to give the list of the people who went up, right? So they do it in a different order. Now, so let's just discuss this a little bit. So here we have this, this Greek manuscript of the book of Ezra that differs from the Hebrew manuscript. And... And, and people will just dismiss it. They'll just say, well, we're going to stick with the King James Bible, with the Hebrew manuscript, and this Greek manuscript is just corrupt and it's not good for anything. We should just throw it out. We're not going to be studying uh, the Apocrypha, right? Um, now, Ellen White makes some statements regarding the Apocrypha. Obviously, we know that it has corruptions in it, right? But it is useful. It gives us some information or clarifies some things that um, that we don't have. Also, we have Maccabees, and it gives us a history of the intertestamental period that 
most Christians don't know anything about because it's not in their Bible. So they never know what happens between um, Malachi and Matthew, right? Correct. And, and so, so there are things in it that we need to know. We need to know this history. That's what I believe that Ellen White really is pointing us to, is to understand this history that's sort of been neglected by Christianity. It's just when it's not known, right? And, and that's just because, you know, we don't trust the Apocrypha. And yet it was used by Christians until, you know, the mid 1800s. And, and even afterwards. Okay, so so we have this information that's in here, and yes, we can't trust it in the same way that we would uh, the Hebrew. But if it doesn't pre present something, and the way that I look at at um, not just studying the uh, the apocrypha, but even anything we dig from God's word, if it never if it does not contradict. Um, contradict the plain reading of God's word and it ties things together and makes things more understandable there's no reason to reject uh, any information that does that mm -hmm. right obviously if we found things in the apocrypha and they would contradict the plain reading of God's word we would say well these are just corruptions that came into this Greek manuscript in the years that it had been copied and recopied. But if there are things that sort of help tie it together and make it make sense, then there's no, and it doesn't contradict any plain reading of God's word or any teaching in God's word. There's no reason to reject it. Now, in this, there's going to be this uh, prayer of Ezra, right? which we don't see also in the book of Ezra. Now, now what are the possibilities? What is, why would, why would this Greek manuscript, I mean, there's two different theories or a few different theories. Um, some would say it's just, it's a manuscript where they took the book of Ezra and they just elaborate on it with fanciful <clears throat> stories, right? So, but some of those things seem a bit hard to to take because when we looked at Esther, for instance, we found that there was information there in the apocryphal Esther that actually helped make things make sense and they put it in context and they weren't things that were wrong. I mean, so, so could it be that what we have with the Hebrew Ezra is just a different compilation of the story of Ezra, and it just happened to survive. And the one that has uh, the Greek one is is valid as far as it goes. H how would we look at it? Because there doesn't seem to be a contradiction here when you read the story in First Esdras. Um, I mean, there, there is some, uh, some information, like for instance, you'll see that this is gonna start with the story of the Passover of Josiah, right? So it's gonna give some, some things that aren't in the book of Ezra, but then it's going to give you uh, the story of Cyrus, nothing fanciful in this story. Right. It's just going to give a little bit different account. And I don't know, you know, I haven't spent time, I've read through this in the past, but I haven't, um, you know, done a detailed study of this. So I don't know whether we should or not. I mean, maybe not at this point, but at some point we probably need to look at First Esdras. But here, anyway, in this chapter eight, we're going to have this story, and um, um, and then in chapter nine, um, I'm trying to remember all the stuff that was in here. So you're going to have that same story 
about um, they should be gathered at Jerusalem, right? And whosoever met not there within two or three days, according as the elders that bear rule appointed, their cattle should be seized to be used of the temple and himself cast from them that were of the captivity. And in three days were all they of the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, gathered together at Jerusalem on the 20th day of the ninth month. So we're going to have the same same story that we have in Ezra. And, and all the multitude sat trembling in the broad court of the temple because of the present foul weather, right? So we know it, it's a little bit different language because it's from Greek into English. But the Hebrew says because of the great rain, right? So same idea. And they're going to have this divorcement set up. Um, Right. And that's going to say uh, in verse 16, and Ezra, the priest chose unto him the principal men of their families all by name. And in the first day of the 10th month, they sat together to examine the matter. So their cause that held strange wives was brought to an end on the first day of the first month. Right. So exactly the same chronology. No reason to say that, you know, this is somehow uh, wrong. It's going to give you the same, same information just in slightly different language. So it's, it's a translation from the Hebrew, but it also has things, a few details added here and there. But basically the same story. So, so is this relevant to what we're studying right now? I think it, it opens the door a little further. Okay. So, I mean, I'm going to read through this again, if I, if I have some time um, between now and Sunday. I'm just going to do like my personal study on it and try to see if there are some things here that could be relevant. Um, but well, but the, point, the point that I'm making is when you're looking at Ezra, it just jumps into the story of chapter 7 right just jumps in here and it doesn't seem to flow the same way as it does in in the apocryphal ezra well it speaks about the events in the seventh year of artaxerxes yeah which yeah which it does here right in the seventh year of artaxerxes the king so we know that this is when they're going to leave babylon and go to Jerusalem, right? It's going to be in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And, and they're going to get there in the fifth month, right? Which is, and it says in verse nine, for upon the first day of the first month, began he, he to go up from Babylon. On the first day of the fifth month, came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. So both of these are going to tell you the same information. And then we're going to have the copy of this uh, decree or letter from Artaxerxes that he gave to Ezra. So, so Artaxerxes is going to give this message, but in in you know it's just we don't have in this one here. It just says, um, where is it here? The king granted him all his request. But it doesn't say anything about his request. So I'm going to try to find if I can see more about that. It just says that Ezra made a request. And so it's telling us that, you know, his request is granted, but it doesn't tell us what his request was, right? It doesn't say here was Ezra as it does in the, the sec, uh, first Ezra's. You know, it tells us a bit about who he was, right? So that was kind of the... I mean, the point of looking there. So when we go to chapter eight, so it says, after these things, when Artaxerxes, the king of Persians, came, reigned, came Ezra, the son of Sarias, right, is his name. Um, he went up from Babylon as a scribe, and the king did him honor, for he found grace in his sight in all his requests, right? So it gives us a bit more background. It doesn't it doesn't tell us what his request is, but it says that there was these requests, 
And so he has this relationship with Artaxerxes. So, and then it's going to tell of the story of him, just like it does in, in, the, in Ezra, of them leaving Babylon and going to Jerusalem with this letter from Artaxerxes. So, it, so anyway, that's, that's what we're looking at right now. Now, Artaxerxes um, decree that we have here in the Bible, uh, Seventh-day Adventists generally, they say, well, we have Cyrus's decree, Darius's decree, and Artaxerxes' decree, and Artaxerxes has two decrees. And so we say, well, which decree are we going to use uh, to start the 70 weeks of Daniel, right? So we, we sort of say we, we need to pick a decree. Now, and when you look at Daniel chapter 9, which we're not really doing a study on right now, but when it talks about the going of the fourth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, uh, but not for himself. And then it's going to talk about the appearance of the people that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And then it says, in the, and he shall uh, confirm the covenant with, with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Right. So we know that um, uh, Daniel chapter nine. But in, in Daniel chapter 9, um, you know, it's going to talk about the destruction of the city. It's going to talk about the, the 70 weeks, the mix, midst of the week. And so we say, well, what decree is going to fit that? But if you look at a commandment to restore and build Jerusalem in the way that we read it, well, Artaxerxes' decree doesn't really do that. It's not really a commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Um, and most Adventists would say uh, that the temple is going to be built under Artaxerxes' decree, right? So they're going to read um, uh, Ezra 6, uh, verse um, 14, right? That it was built and finished according to the commandment of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. And so they say, well, the temple's built after Artaxerxes, even though it plainly says it's completed in the sixth year of Darius. So we don't read very carefully. We don't really understand this history. And, um, you know, so in studying Daniel chapter 10, even though Daniel chapter 10 is addressing the Cyrus's decree, we know that it's connected to Darius's and Artaxerxes decree. And so there tends to be this, uh, well, a diminution of the first two, dec two decrees and just an acknowledgement of the third decree. And we have something very similar with the three angels messages in Millerite history. Is there a diminution of the first and second angels messages in Adventism? even in conservative Adventism. We just, we focus on the third angel's message, right? And there's nothing wrong with the third angel's message, and there's nothing wrong with Artaxerxes' decree. But can you have a third without the first and the second? No. Yeah, we can't, right? So we need to understand uh, those decrees and how they're connected. Now, when we get to Daniel, um, so let's go back to Daniel. Uh, I guess we could do it this way. So when we get to Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, so Daniel is, he's only prophesying up until the first year of Cyrus, which here is called the third year of Cyrus, right? So Daniel's not in that history. He's not living in the history of the second decree. He's not living in the history of the third decree. 
but we know that he's giving information that helps us to understand uh, these decrees. Right? And, and Daniel chapter 9, of course, is about the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, which to me is the return of the people. It's talking about 457 BC in Daniel chapter 9. It's not talking about Cyrus's decree. So in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel's just concerned about the first decree, Cyrus's. But yet Daniel chapter 9 tells us about the third decree. And you can see how people just in superficially reading things, uh, they would just say, well, it's going to be Cyrus's decree that's going to be the start of the 70 weeks because you just read in chapter 9 about a decree, right? And now you have Cyrus and, and there's going to be a decree, right? So Cyrus is going to be the one that starts the 70 weeks. And, and I've seen all kinds of interpretations uh, that where people will take uh, the first 49 years, uh, that's in the time of, of um, you know, Cyrus, right? And they're going to have really strange chronologies to try to make things fit. And then the 62 weeks is going to be this other history, completely different history. Uh, dealing with Christ, and then the 70th week is going to be in the future. You know, that's going to be, uh, you know, when the secret rapture happens and things like that. So you're going to see all these different types of interpretations. But we're using Miller's rules here, and and our addition to the rules and placing these things on a line. So, so when we look at Daniel 10, 11, and 12, which I think we need to get back to, instead of going down the other path. We have the background to understand um, this history. So we know it's the first decree that's going to be issued on the 24th day of the first month. And uh, this vision then is going to be covering this history of the kings of Persia, but it's going to be giving us information at the end of the world. So Daniel 10, 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. We can see that this verse, the way that we've understood it in this movement, is that we're going to understand the history as revealed in the Bible as the primary history to understand our time. So we're not going to look at all the kings of Persia, because there's lots of them. Um, we're going to look at the ones that are given us to look at. So now we're at Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> so here it says, Also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now, oddly, people will take this verse and believe that this is Daniel chapter 11 is given in the first year of Darius the Mede. So they're going to place it at the same time as Daniel chapter 9. But that's not what the verse is saying. He's saying, because I'm going to tell you what's noted in the scripture of truth, I want you to know that also when Babylon fell, I was there. And now I will tell thee the truth, Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So what the angel is doing here is he's directing us back to Ronald Reagan, right? Darius the Mede. And he's here in this history. So which history is he in prophetically? He's in really the first year of Cyrus, right? We can call it the third year of Cyrus, but it's the first year, right? So he's at the time of the end, right? He's at the first decree, the first angel's message. Do you understand what, what we're saying here? Where Daniel is in vision here, he's standing in 1989. 
right? That's how we've understood this. So now, yet there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So we know that's going to be Cambyses, False Myrtus, and Darius, right? Darius the Persian, Darius the Great, the Staspes. And then there's going to be a fourth. Now, we know the fourth is in the scripture of truth. That's going to be Xerxes, right? So if we're at 1989, we know that we can, and it's important, I think, here to place uh, Daniel, to place this vision where he is, because he's not at the end of He's, he's not standing in our time, so to speak, right? He's, he's not standing in the top time of Xerxes. He's not standing in the time of Arctic Xerxes, right? He's not, he's not later. He's standing in the time of Cyrus. So he's in 1989. Okay, why is this important? What, what am I doing here? What am I trying to establish? Does anybody understand what I'm doing here? This is a very important point. Yeah, you place in Daniel in 1989, right? Okay. In the book of Revelation, we have John in vision. And when John's in vision, he can be standing at different points in history, right? Right. And, and, and there's always a lot made of this, especially in, in relationship to Revelation 17. We say, well, John is in 1798. Okay. Right? In Revelation 17. Because five are fallen. So he has to be in 1798. Five are fallen. Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal. One is the United States, and one's yet to come, okay? And the pioneers understood this, but they understood that um, you can be a certain place in vision, but when you have an explanation, the explanation is from the time in which you actually are in. So we, we need to understand this point. This is, this is going to be important as we look at... Um, these, these prophecies, and we try to relate it to our time of how to understand Revelation 17, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, in relation to Daniel 11. But here, Daniel is, he's, he's literally in uh, 536, right? I mean, that's where he is. He's in the time of Cyrus. He's in 536, and and so historically, he's he that's where he is, and so he's been given this explanation of of what's going to happen, and so that he's literally in a specific place in history. So when we look at Revelation uh, chapter 17. And um, <clears throat> and it talks about in 17, verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, right? And, and it says, here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. Now, we would say here he is in the future, right? He's carried, carried me away into the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast, 
full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So where is he in vision? From 538 to 1798. Okay, so he's in the wilderness. So somewhere in that period between 538 and 1798, that's where he is taken to in vision. Just like Daniel in Daniel chapter 8, he's carried away to 457 BC, right? He's carried away to the start of the 2300 days. So so a, a prophet can be taken to a different point of time. But the pioneers understood that the explanation has to be taken in the context of when the prophet lived. So the way that they would interpret this is they say, um, uh, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And show and go into perdition, right? So it it's talking, you know, the angel's talking to John in the time that John lives. He's in 97 AD, right? And so that's that's how we would take this. This is how the pioneers took it. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. So the pioneers understood this to be the seven forms of Roman government. Five of them are fallen, one is. The one that is, is imperial Rome, and the other is not yet come, that would be papal Rome. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now we take this short space, we say, oh, you know, that can't be 1260 years. But 1260 years is prophetically a short space. Because what does that mean, a short space? Why is it called a short space if it's 1260 years? Now, the word itself um, doesn't really mean short space. It means puny in extent, degree, number, duration, or value. Could be translated as season. So the pioneers understood that this was the 1260. Okay. And then it says, the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven. Now, what's the beast that was and is not in the time of imperial Rome would be republicanism. Right. And, and the way that uh, jo uh, Joseph Bates understood this is that this is a reference back to Revelation chapter 13 to the two-horned beast, right? So that's how the pioneers understood it. And so it's something that we're going to have to address when we get there. But I just want to draw your attention to this problem of how we, we try to decide where we are in a prophecy. So Daniel is in, in Daniel chapter 10, he's literally in the history of the first decree. He's in the history of Cyrus. So in Daniel chapter 11, he's still there in the history of Cyrus, right? So we're not gonna bring him to, to some other place. Now he parallels a history with our time. Now, when we interpret Revelation 17 the way that we do, I believe that we're doing the same thing. We're taking a history that occurred in the past 
and we're making a parallel to our history. And we haven't understood that we were doing that. We will see that when we get there, when we get to Revelation 17 and we start to go through it, that there's nothing wrong with the application we made regarding Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, the United States, the UN, and the eighth being the papacy, the revival of this one that received the deadly wound. But when we're doing that, we're making an application. We're not taking the prophecy in its actual sense. Just as when we take Daniel chapter 11 and we place him here at 1989, we're making an application of that. And once we understand that, we can then put these stories together and we can see where we are in history, right? Because that's the question that we have is, what are we going through right now? Are we going through the actual history, that is the antitypical history of the Sunday law, or are we in a typical history? That is, are the events of this movement that we thought were the events of the Sunday law, are they only typical of that? That is, this movement is prefiguring something that's going to happen. And, and this is a point that I've made for years regarding Samuel Snow. Samuel Snow is typical. He, he's typical of what's going to happen October 22nd, 1844. That is his letters, his July 18 letter, his last letter before midnight, the prediction before midnight is a type because July 18, 187 is pointing to October 22, 1844, which is the 187th day of the Jewish year. And so his prediction before midnight, his history, Samuel Snow's history, is typifying what's going to happen in Millerite history. And if we take the position that this movement is Samuel Snow, then we would have to take the position that our movement is typical of what's going to happen in Adventism and in the world at the Sunday Law. And if it's typical, it can't be the actual. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. So this is the problem that, that this movement has been facing. And, and, and we need to understand these things because we have work to accomplish and we need to know what that work is. We have a message to give and we need to know what that message is. And we all want Christ to come back immediately, right? We would love to have the end time events wrap up quickly. But if we look at the condition of the church, and if we look at the condition of this movement, we can see that work has to be done. And that's gonna take time. And we've sh shown in our lines that we have this application for the additional extension of time. That is, this movement has made this application And, and you can see what I mean by application, because remember, it's, it's this tax document, number 2688, and it's an application. But we're talking about an application in the sense of applying prophecy in a specific way. So we're not wanting additional extension of time, but we're making an application that gives us an extension of time, that is a time in which to file our taxes, so to speak, right? That is, we have this responsibility to fulfill. And that responsibility has to be fulfilled before Christ can return. So we're gonna start looking at Daniel chapter 11. I think we have enough background information to understand this. We're going to start slowly going through this history. So even though we already have done this many times, we're going to go through it 
and try to look at uh, how we can take Daniel 11 and place it on a line, how we're going to structure and understand this. So I know that we, we just like to jump in and put in the kings and the presidents and say, you know, here it is. This is what Jeff gave us. And now we just need to continue following through, recognizing Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. But I think there is something more here that we we haven't comprehended. And there's a bunch of symbols that we need to address. So one is when we studied the book of Judges, we had an understanding of the Hebrew definition numbers, uh, the gematria um, of names and how they relate to periods and spans of time. And so we should be able to take this history from 1989 to our history and we should be able to see just as we did in the book of judges we should be able to see this in our history that we can take these kings you know cyrus well darius the mede even but you know cyrus cambyses false Myrtus, darius and xerxes and we should be able to see things here that we hadn't seen before that confirms that God was leading us in our application, but giving us further light on how to understand what's coming and to some degree when it's coming, right? And I'm not talking about time setting. Now, I, I just want to comment on one other thing. So, so that's where we're going to be beginning on Sunday, we're going to start looking at this. But um, there is in um, in WhatsApp, um, there is, uh, and I see this on Facebook as well, there are studies that are trying to uh, set dates. And it doesn't really matter, you know, who's making them or whatever. Um, but these dates are based upon assumptions. So one is the assumption that we can predict events. Um, but also just, just that we can do simple things like uh, count 25, 20 days from November 9th, 2019. And that's going to give us a date that we can then mark an event. Right, so there is, let me see here. Um, you know, I've seen these charts, you know, we got April 22nd, uh, 2023 in these charts. We got um, most recent one gives us October 3rd, 2026. Um, So what are we supposed to do with this information? Like, how do, we, how do we address this? Because there are people who are following what we're doing, and yet they continue to put dates in the future. And of course, we do have dates in the future, right? Symbolic dates. So, so we're going to have to somehow sort out what it is we're doing. And, and I think we have, but we have to make it really clear for people of how we place dates in the future and what they mean. So that's just another aside, uh, a point that I think relates to this study, because we're looking at things in the future. How do we relate to uh, predicting things in the future? Not even just about a specific dates, but how the future is going to unfold. Because we get light for our feet um, and we need to know what that is. Um, but we're not given light off in the future other than, I mean, that it relates to our feet right now. So we need to know what's happening in the future because we need to know where we're going. But there are things we don't need to know. 
because they're not really going to help us in our decisions today. So, so those are things that we're going to have to address. Any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not right now. Okay. Well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, um, thank you for the time that we've had here this morning. We have more questions than answers, and we need your help. We pray for the Sabbath coming tomorrow evening, um, for the events of Sabbath, and the context we have with other people, and for the studies that we that, that we will be presenting. We just ask, Lord, that you can work upon our hearts, that you can soften them, that we can see our sin, our need of you, and that we can be reconciled with our brethren. Forgive us for our sins, for our words, our actions that have hindered your work, and help us to reflect your character today. Be with each person. May your Holy Spirit work upon their hearts. May you help them in their day-to-day -day struggles. And we ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.